Okay, so um, you may have noticed that sometimes we make mistakes and we want to undo them, uh, whether that's in life or in files or whatever. Um, in, in the case of uh, files in a computer system, it turns out that there are some really good ways of undoing things. In particular, um, a version control system is a tool that you can use to manage your source code, your text files, your configuration files, whatever you want really, so that you can maintain a persistent history of the changes to those files. So whenever you want to track changes over time, a version control system is probably the place you want to start. In addition, a version control system you can use to share changes between different users. Right? So if you make some changes to a file over time and Anish makes some changes to, those, to like a similar set of files, you might want to be able to combine those changes so that the two of you can work on the same project and you can see what each other has done. Um, there are a ton of version control systems out there that, do, that work differently, um, that give you different features, uh, that are harder or easier to use, that are different assumptions about what kind of files you're working on. Um, in this particular lecture, I'll focus on uh, a tool called Git. Uh, which is one of the more common version control systems that also supports things like uh, working with multiple users, multiple machines, um, and it's also one that's very well supported with by online platforms for uh, sharing source code and those kinds of things. Um, but you will probably find that some of the concepts carry over to other systems as well. Uh, in particular, I'd recommend you take a look at a tool called Mercurial, uh, which many people tout to sort of get without all the weird parts. Uh, whether or not you agree with that is for you to decide uh, by looking at it, but in general, uh, we're going to be using Git in this uh, in all today, and uh, whether you want to explore other things, you can do that on your own time. Um, one, for those of you who may have heard of Git from before, actually, how many of you have heard of Git? Nice, how many of you have used Git? How many of you think that Git is dark magic? I, I certainly do. Yeah, it sounds about right. So um, there's this common adage on the internet that nobody understands Git. It's really just about typing random commands that you find on the internet into your terminal, which we all know is a great idea. Uh, and then they sort of maybe do the right thing. So the goal of this, uh, this lecture is gonna be to teach you a little bit of, more about how, how that works, why those commands do what they do, um, and sort of the, the mental model that you should have in mind when working with version control systems. At the very, very sort of basic level, um, the thing to learn about Git is its data model, how it thinks about the files that you're storing and the history that you're storing. Once you understand the data model, a lot more of the commands that you operate on the history of versions um, is gonna become a lot clearer, like what's going on behind the scenes. Um, the core thing in uh, Git is something known as a commit. So a commit is basically a, a snapshot point in time of the current state of whatever folder you're looking at. So whenever you are using a version control system, it's usually based on some folder and everything underneath it. Uh, and it's sort of a snapshot of that folder, sort of frozen in time version of all the files there are in that folder. Um, and a commit, every commit in Git has a unique name. Um, it's known as a hash. Uh, so it looks a bit like this. So this thing right here is a commit hash. Every single snapshot that you capture, every commit has one of these hashes and they are guaranteed to be unique in the confines of any given Git repository. Um, commits also have a bunch of other information. It records things like who authored that commit, so who made the snapshot. Um, it usually includes some kind of message that describes that snapshot, like why did I choose to take a snapshot right now? Um, it also has a, a ha the hash of the previous commit. So you sort of get a timeline of these are the changes that have happened over time and which changes depend on other changes that have happened before, right? Um, and the commit also represents basically the difference from the previous commit that you made. In particular, um, here, so if I type git log, it shows me the log of changes that have happened to this, to this directory, and you'll see who made each change, what the name of each change is, um, and when that change was made, and the commit message. Um, and in addition, if I do ignore a little bit what this commit says, here, this is a diff showing what is different between the previous commit and this commit. So you can think of these snapshots as basically capturing which things changed from one point in time to another, right? So these green lines are lines that were added. The red lines are lines that were removed. Um, in reality, Git actually stores the full snapshot. It does not just store these differences. Uh, but you can think of each commit as sort of applying a difference to the thing that came before. And that's why it needs to remember what came before. Um, so initially, 
whenever you start out with Git, this is the repository we used in the shell scripting lecture, so it just has a bunch of random files in there with nothing particularly interesting in there. Um, whenever you want to start tracking something with Git, you create a repository. So all every, repository is basically where Git keeps all the information about the folders that it's managing, and you start one with Git in it. Um, you give it then a folder. If it doesn't exist, it's going to be created. In this case, I already have a folder, which is the screwbar folder that I'm currently in. So I'm going to say to git start a new repository in this folder. And what that does is it creates in this directory a .git folder that has a bunch of like hidden information that git uses to track history and those kinds of things. And you'll notice that my prompt, which I've configured, like we talked about in the, in the command line environment lecture, to show me information about uh, current version control status. Um, what exactly is shown in this prompt, you will hopefully understand by the end of this lecture. You should not expect to understand it now. Uh, but just notice that something appeared that made it recognize that this, is, this folder is now a version control. Um, so now that I have, actually, let's start with an empty one first. Uh, So I'm going to cd it empty. So this is now a directory that only has the git. There's no, there are no files in here. The only thing that's in there is the, the sort of hidden git directory, right? There's nothing else in there. Um, and let's see what git thinks about this directory. So there's a command. So all the git commands start with git, and then a subcommand. In this case, status is a command you're going to be using a lot. It tells you what git thinks is the state of the current directory. So in this case, uh, git status actually tells us a lot of things that are going to teach us what git is doing. It says we're on the branch master. It says there are no commits yet. And it says that there's nothing to commit. Let's walk through each of those uh, in order. First, on branch master. Well, it's really annoying if we always had to use these long strings of characters. If I had to tell you, like, I'm currently on 522E6C, et cetera, that would be really, really annoying. So instead, Git has a way of naming these things. Um, and so a branch is a name. The default branch is master. Um, the, what a branch is is really just sort of a name that points to a given commit. Initially, it points to the empty commit, because initially your repository is empty. And then every time you make a change, a new commit is made. It has its new sort of hash that's unique. And then master is updated to point to that updated um, commit name. And so as, as you go along, where master points is going to change. Master is always going to be the latest change on the branch called master. And you can have multiple branches if you want. Uh, there's also a special name called head. So if you notice over here, I said git ignore what rev parse does. You said, I see I wrote head here. Head is always the current commit. Whatever the current commit is, that's what head is. Um, you can also make your own names. So if I do git branch, uh, I can name a new branch called foobar. And I could give it something like this thing to point the name foobar at this commit. If I then made additional changes to the underlying repository, then the foobar branch would not be changed. It would still be pointed to that commit, unless I chose to update it to point to something else. By default, you're on the master branch. What being on a branch means is that whenever you make a new commit, that branch name is updated to point to the latest commit. So if I were to make a commit in this directory, master would be updated to point to that, but any other branches would not be changed. They would retain whatever they were previously pointing to. Um, no commits yet is sort of self-explanatory. We created a new repository, and there are no commits in there. We have taken no snapshots, and therefore there are no commits. Um, and this uh, third line, this nothing to commit, commit, actually is really, really interesting again. Um, as I mentioned, every commit sort of contains the, the difference that you made, right? The, it sort of contains all the changes you made since the last time you took a snapshot. Um, but how do you construct one of these differences in the first place? Like, how do you say what it is you want to include in a commit? Of course, you could assume that if I have a bunch of changes in the current folder, I always want to commit the current snapshot of all the files. I want to take a snapshot of everything that's there. You could do that, but sometimes there might be some things you don't want to include in a commit, right? I might have some files in there that are just sort of temporary. Uh, I might have made some changes in a file that aren't really ready to be committed yet. I just want to commit other parts of that file. Um, 
Or sometimes I might have made uh, multiple different changes and I want to break them up into different commits. Maybe with different messages to sort of explain why I made each change and so that it's easier for someone else to look, who looks at my change. Instead of seeing just one large change, they can look at multiple smaller ones. So it makes sense that sometimes I only want to make a commit of parts of the changes I've made. And so this last, um, this last line is basically telling us about that feature. You have a way in Git to say that I want to stage this change for the upcoming commit. Basically, I want to say that this change should be included in the next commit. To give you an example of this, um, let's see. So I'm going to first make a commit with the message, uh, this is the first commit. So this is just uh, the sort of first commit in the repository. It contains nothing in it. I'm just saying this repository starts out empty. So I've created a commit now. Uh, that is apparently false. Oh, I may need to, may need to include something. Fine. Uh, close your eyes and ignore this for a second. This didn't happen. You don't know what that is. Great. Uh, great. So the directory is empty, uh, and git status now says I'm on branch master. There's nothing to commit. Now, because I made a commit, that you can sort of ignore. It doesn't say no commits yet because there are commits now. So in this repository now, let's say that I want to add a new file, right? So I'm gonna use bin and I'm gonna create a file called hello. And in that file, I'm gonna say world. So now git status says untracked files, hello. Nothing has been added to commit, but there are untracked files. So in this case, I can use git add to add a particular file to the commit that I'm about to make. This is saying, take all the changes I've made to the file hello and sort of stage them to be included in the commit I'm about to make. Similarly, um, let's say that I now make a change to hello. I say foobar down here. And then I look at git status. What's it tell me? It says changes to be committed, new file hello, changes not staged for commit, modified hello, right? So I added hello to the sort of stage, the stage set of changes for the upcoming commit, but the line where I added foobar, that line was not part of what I added. So what it's telling me is that it has included part of the file, but there are also changes that it will not include in the upcoming commit. And I can look at those by saying git diff, right? So git diff tells me these are the things that have not yet, these are differences that have not yet been staged for the commit. I can also look at which changes I have staged by saying git, git diff staged. And we'll say that it's created the hello file, added the line below. Um, I can also then do something like uh, add another file, and in there I'm going to just say, I can add bar, and now you'll say git status says new file bar, new file hello, and hello has still been modified because there's a line in there that I haven't said I want to include. And at this point, um, I can, sure. Uh, at this point, I can create a commit by saying git commit, and that takes all of the changes that I've staged and creates a commit out of them, creates a snapshot. It's then going to open an editor and says, please enter a commit message for this change. So this is basically, how do I describe this change to someone else who's looking at the list of changes that I've made? Or even just for my own records, like why did I make this change? I uh, wanted to show, we'll say that I know you. Right? And so now it says, great, I created a commit on master. This is sort of the first few characters of its hash. This is the title of that commit. Two files were changed, two, there were two inserted lines, and it created these two files. And if I now look at git status, it now just says that hello has been modified, right? Because that difference is still there. But the files that I added, that has now been included with the commit. Um, similarly, if I wanted to remove a file, I could do git rm bar, and that removes the file from the current directory and also stages the removal of that file so that if I make a commit, that file will be removed in that commit, right? And so if I now do git commit, uh, remove bar because it was unnecessary. Now I've created another commit, right? That's great, so now we have a bunch of commits. Why are those helpful at all? Why do we want commits? 
Well, it turns out you can do a lot of useful things with commit. For example, I can run git log, uh, and git log shows me all the changes that I've made. I could run git log one line if I wanted a slightly shorter summary, which shows me the start of the revision hash, the sort of unique name for each commit, with the description of each one. So this might be useful if I want to track what changes I've made in the past, or if other people have made changes, then I can see what changes they made and why. Similarly, um, I can even look at the exact change that was made with the dash p flag, which is the same as uh, dash dash patch, so which shows me what the change was in that commit. So here, for example, you'll see that the commit 2244, uh, where I removed bar because it was unnecessary, uh, removed this line from bar, thereby removing the file. This commit, um, where I wanted to show Jose that I know git, added the file bar with the content Jose, and added the line world to hello. And here you can also see the other changes that I made earlier that we just sort of ignored. And if I make more changes, they will also be shown in this list. Um, I can also show a particular change. So show um, shows you the commit that you named. And remember, master is just a name that points to a commit, particular commit. Master is the current commit on this branch. So if I do git show master, it shows me information about the last commit. And you'll notice at the top here, it says that head is pointing to master. So remember, head is the current commit. So git show head gives me the exact same information. They both just show me the, the latest commit on the current branch. Um, but in the log, if I say copy this revision, I could do git show that one. And then it will show me what that commit was. Um, here, similarly, I can also use the dash p flag to show what the actual contents of the change was to the patch. Um, and we can go back to a previous commit. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get rid of that. So git status, there's nothing here. I got rid of the one line that I added because it wasn't important. Um, now, let's say that I look at the log, and I want to basically, I want to go back to what the repository looked like back here, right? Back at this point, before I wanted to show Jose that I know Git, right? So I copy this hash, this, this sort of name snapshot in my history, and I say git checkout that hash. So git is telling me a lot of things now, but if I do ls, there are no files here. Because at that point in history, the snapshot was that there were no files in that directory, right? So it's showing me the state of everything in this folder as of that commit. Notice that it's telling me you are in detached head state. What that means is pretty much that there's no name that refers to where I currently am. So if I make more commits from here, no name is gonna be pointing to those commits. So I don't really have a good way of getting back to them. I can't say like log master or whatever. I have to remember the commit hashes. So it's telling me like, you can make commits here, but if you do, they'll sort of just be out there floating in free space with no easy name to remember them by. Um, I can then also get checkout master to go back to where I was. Um, and I can in fact undo a change too. So this removed bar, actually let's make a new change. Hello, let's add foo bar, right? So now diff is foo bar, commit dash a. So dash a means add all the changes to any files that are known. It's sort of the same as just adding git add all the changes separately. Um, commit dash a just adds all of them at once. This is saying I want to include all changes in the current directory in this commit. And I say, uh, add a line. Great, so it made a new commit. And now I decide that I didn't want foobar there after all. So then I can type git revert and the name of that commit, which git told me here. So I'm gonna revert that change. And what that's gonna do is that git is gonna look up the change that I made in that commit and do the inverse of it and apply it to the current head. Right? So if I do, if I show the gif for the diff for this change, uh, ignore what that means, um, or actually, here. Uh, so it's going to take this diff, right, which said that I added a line to foobar, and it's going to turn every plus into a minus and every minus into a plus. So every removed line is going to be an added line, and every added line is going to be a removed line. And 
then it's gonna, ooh, that's not good too. Uh, git log. So if I do git revert this, it's gonna create the new commit that undoes the previous commit. So you notice it dropped me directly into my editor with a, a message that's already been filled out saying revert this commit, with including the hash of the commit I'm reverting. And now if I look at the log, you'll see that the added align commit is still there in the history, then it's followed by a commit that reverts that change. And now, if I look at the contents of hello, you'll notice that there's no foo bar in there anymore, because that change has been reverted. Um, I can also look at the changes that have been made over a period of time. So let's say, for example, that I want to look at all the changes that have been made since this nope commit. Well, I can do git diff that dot dot. So what that means, so dot dot gives a commit range. Uh, and if you have, say, a dot dot b, what that means is um, select all the commits from a to b. If you leave either of them off, what that means is head. Right, so this, is, this here is the same as this. And head, as we remember, is the current commit. So what this will actually do is show me all the differences between what was in the repository at the time of this first commit and what is in the repository now. And that is only that file, but if I now um, edit hello, added foobar, uh, committed that with a message, uh, add back foobar. So notice that I can use the dash m flag to add a commit message without being dropped into my editor. Just a shorthand way that saves some time. So now, if I ask for the diff, it'll show me that hello has these lines both added, right? In fact, I could also do, so remember this is the change we reverted, so we would expect that a diff from this point removed that line because that was a change that we reverted later. And so indeed, if I do this, uh, ooh, oh, I added the same line, didn't I? So if I now do git from that, it'll tell me that since that point in my history, so since where we were when we were here, the changes that have been made is that foobar has been turned to zubas. If I went back to no, the changes are that I've just added those lines, right? Because the comparison points are different. Uh, um, in addition, you'll notice that now I have a bunch of weird commits in this history and what if all of this like add back business, like all of this was not really important. The only thing that really mattered was that I wanted to show if I say that I know git. So really all that matters to me is that master points to this commit. All the other stuff in between I can just get rid of. I just want master to start pointing here. Well I can do that with git reset. So git reset is saying take the current name, the current branch, which in this case is master, and set it to point to this commit instead of whatever it's currently pointing to. So if I do this, now, what it's telling me is, um, if I look at the log, that we're now, like master, head is pointing to master, master is pointing to this commit, and these are the only commits I've seen so far. Right, because master now points to that commit, it believes that the current state of the world is this. Uh, is this. Right, and therefore, all of those other changes that I've made are now in diff, they're unstaged changes. So it hasn't gotten rid of anything from my working directory at all. It will generally not do that unless you write, unless you pass, basically there's a command line flag called dash dash hard. Um, if you pass that, it might change your current working directory, but in general, it will not. So here, when I did git reset, it didn't like change the contents of my files, it just changed where in the history git thinks I am. And so any difference will be compared to that as opposed to where I previously was. Uh, great. So now these are the changes. I'm just gonna, yeah, so let's say that I decide that I want to add hello. I want to add the change from hello, right? So hello currently has a change, which is add this line Zubas. If I add hello, then now this change has been staged to be included in the next commit, right? So git diff will no longer show that change. It only shows the deletion of bar. 
In fact, sure, let's uh, rm bar as well. So now I'm about to make a commit that deletes bar and adds that line to hello. Let's say that I actually just wanted to remove bar. I didn't want to make that change to hello. Git reset hello will unstage a change that I have staged. So reset have, has two meanings. It has change where the current branch points and remove, remove this staged change. It's kind of stupid that it's been overloaded to mean two things. It just so happens to do. So if I do git reset hello and git status, it will now tell me that bar is staged to be deleted, uh, but the change to hello is still not staged. So if I make a commit, bar will be removed, but that's the only change that will be included in the commit. So clearly, as we've sort of seen so far, um, names are really important in Git, like being able to name things, whether that's through a branch, whether that's through head, through like dot dot, or using hashes directly. There are a bunch of different ways of naming things, and it turns out that this is pretty handy. Sometimes you want to log, say, the last three commits, or show the difference in the last two commits, um, revert the previous commit. There are a bunch of these kind of things that would be handy if we, had, um, we didn't have to go through the log all the time and like copy paste the revision hashes. And so Git has a really handy way of um, talking about commits. So for example, I mentioned how you can make your own branch. Uh, so I can do git branch b. This creates a, creates a branch called b that points to the current commit. So currently master whatever the current commit is, current commit is this hash. So now both master and b point to that hash. If I now make a commit here, so if I do git show b, it'll show this commit. If I do git show master, it will show that same commit. Ooh, master. It shows that same commit, right? Ah. So b and master are the same commit currently. If I now make a change to master, so I do uh, bar, sorry, okay. And I make a commit on master that says, uh, sorry. Um, then now, if I git show master, then master, the latest commit on master is that commit. The last is latest commit on B is still the one that master was pointing to because B is still pointing to the old commit, right? So in the log, you'll notice that B is pointing to this commit, master is pointing to this commit. Because it's only the branch you're currently on that gets updated when you make it. Um, you can switch to another um, to an existing branch by doing git checkout and then the name of the branch. Uh, B. So you'll notice here if I now cat hello, it still says uh, if I now cat bar, it still says so say. If I check out master and cat bar, it now includes that change. And so I can switch back and forth. There's also a name called just dash. So dash means go to the previous name I was at. Or, so in this case, switches to B, and switches to master, B, master, etc. This is a convenient way of your swi switching back and forth between things. Um, ignore tags. Tags are handy, um, but they're basically read only branches. Or you make them once and you can't change them. They're just sort of think of something like you're making a version release. Like I want to release version 3.0 of my software, I would tag that commit with 3.0. That tag will never change. It will never point to anything else. It will always point to that commit. So a tag is like a write once, read many times type of commit, a type of name. Um, there's also, so we have this log. Um, let's say that I want to see the difference between B and master. I can do that that way, right? So this was dot dot to show the difference between commits. I could also look at, let's say that I want to look at the last change that happened on master. If I do git diff master, that doesn't show me anything. Because what this is really saying is the difference between master and head. I'm on master, so head is master. So this is the difference between master and master. That's not particularly useful. Instead, what I can do is I can add a caret. If I add a caret, what that means is the commit before this one. So this means the commit before master. And remember, if I don't put anything, it's dot dot head. So this is saying the commit before master to head. And head is master. So the commit before master to master. And that will indeed show me the latest commit. I can go further back too. 
Um, but then I have to switch from, then I can just add more of these. So this is the change from the commit before the commit before master to head. And similarly, I can keep adding them. Um, if I use tilde, which basically means the same as caret, um, then I can even do things like tilde three, which is go three commits back, or five commits back, or six commits back. So I can keep moving back as far as I want. In general, commits will operate on head unless you give another command. So if I do git diff, that what that really means is git diff head. Similarly, if I do git show, that means git show head, which is the current commit, so it will show me the current commit. So over time, you might notice that um, we get to a point where, let's go back to where we had a long, weird history that was kind of useless. Down here, right, so here I had a long, ugly history. So I'm gonna make master, you know, make master point back to here. Git reset hard is saying, uh, remove any local changes I have and just make the current directory look like the current commit. So now I have this hello file, but I have a log that has a bunch of weird stuff in it. That's a bunch of unnecessary changes that I don't really care about. And it turns out that very often this ends up happening when you're doing development, right? You'll have some commit that you wrote up very nicely where you like added a feature, and then it turns out there was a typo in that feature, and then it turns out there was a bug in that feature, and then it turns out that you had to make another change in that feature, and then you had to back out that previous change, and then you had to make the test pass, and so you end up with this long list of commits that are getting shorter and shorter and shorter in your description, because at the end you just type, like the commit message is typo, or X, or fixed. This very easily ends up happening, but it's not really very useful when you come back to the same folder like a year later, and want to figure out what change you made and why. And so Git provides you tools for basically editing your history, for saying all of these changes I can really express in a better way. Um, there is, first of all, if I want to make a change, um, I can do something like, let's say that I made a typo somewhere. Let's say that in hello, this shouldn't have said Zubaz. It should have said Zubaz Z. Because of course, right, that was a typo, clearly. Um, now, I don't really want to make a new commit with this, because the previous commit, the one I'm currently on, that's what changed it from foobar to zubas. Right? So that commit maybe was sensible, but there was a typo. In this case, I can do git command a right? So commit a is going to include all of the current differences in the commit that I'm about to make. And I can say dash dash amend, which is instead of creating a new commit, amend the current commit with this change. So basically, undo the current commit, and then redo it, but including this change. So, right? So the current commit, add back Zubas, adds Zubas here. If I wanted this, this difference that I've made previously, actually, maybe it's easier to show this in a real repository here. Okay, so this is the stuff for the Hacker Tools lecture. So let's see, I probably made a typo somewhere in version control. So the last, if we look at the, li the log here, it's like a bunch of stuff here. And the last thing I did, did was add some version control exercises. Okay, so let's look at those. The bottom, let's say that um, this should say repository, okay? So the diff now is that that line changed from saying repo to repository. In fact, I can do color words if I wanted to, and it will show me just that difference. Um, but I don't really want to make a new commit just for this one change. I sort of want to just include that with the previous change that I made. If I do git commit dash a dash dash amend, what that's gonna do is it's gonna change the previous commit to also include this change. It's as if there was no commit that introduced the word repo, and so there was only the commit that introduced the full word repository. In fact, I can go even further than that, uh, by rewriting entire segments of history. So this command, git rebase, lets you take some segment of, segment of commits, undo all of them, and redo them in a different way. Dash i is saying interactive, like ask me what to do at every step. And I'm saying do that for all the commits from 
head from six commits previous to head to head. Or just this way is the same way. So the past six commits, we're going to rebase. Uh, do I? Sure. Why? So this shows me a history of the last six commits to the current branch, and then asks me what I want to do about each one. And you'll notice that the bottom here, it gives me a bunch of options. So pick is the default. Pick means leave this commit the way it is. Don't do anything weird with it, just leave it the way it was. But I have a couple of options. I can say R or reword. Uh, what that will do is it will reapply that commit where it was in the history, um, but let me edit the commit message. I can also do edit, which is when you get to this commit, when you're like replaying this commit, then stop before continuing and let me make edits. I can also say fix up. So fix up is saying fold this commit into the previous one. It's basically pretend that when I made this commit, I passed dash dash and then. I'm just gonna get rid of this commit. This commit is no longer going to be in the version history. Instead, there's just gonna be this commit, which is also gonna include the changes from this. I can also say squash, which is a little bit like fix up, except that it keeps the commit messages from both. But there'll still only be one commit at the end. I can also reorder things. So now, if so for example, here I have added a line and revert added a line. I don't really need those two commits. Those are sort of unnecessary because they cancel each other out. So I can just remove both. Now, when it's replaying the history, it will just never apply those changes. It will be as though they never existed. Similarly, this add back foo bar, so let's see, this adding y was a fix up. Uh, this, we're gonna reword into added zuba z, right? And maybe this line, who knows, let's show what edit does. So now the new edit history is going to be this commit, then this commit after we make some edits, then this commit with the change commit message, and then this commit is gonna be folded into that commit. When I exit this, rebase is gonna start doing that. It says, okay, I started doing it, I stopped at this commit, this is the one we said we wanted to, uh, to edit, and then it says you can amend this commit now. Right, so I can change it if I want to. So here, let's say I, I actually meant to also uh, echo world into a bar called world, and add world, uh, and then re uh, git commit amend to edit that commit I'm currently at in the rebasing. And then I'm gonna continue rebasing. Here, I asked it to be able to change the commit message. So it's telling me here, you can edit the commit message. And now if I look at the log, notice that the log looks a lot cleaner. Now there's none of this like added and reverted that has gone away. This removed bar because it was unnecessary is still there. This commit now adds back Zuba Z. So I've edited the word and there's no commit following it. So I've basically rewritten my history into one that's easier to grasp later. In fact, if I wanted to, I could rebase all of these commits into a single one. That's also known as squashing. It's like saying all the details of what I did in between here don't really matter. All that matters is the overall change. So very often, if you make a contribution to some open source project, you may want to clean up your history before submitting it to them because the fact that you like introduced the bug and then fixed the bug is probably not <coughs> relevant to those maintainers when they're trying to figure out what change you made. Instead, you're going to squash your commits or into some s smaller set of logical commits before you send it to them so they can review the commits individually. Um, so a common use case for version control is to allow other people to also make changes to the same things that you're working on, right? So for example, for the lecture notes for this class, uh, Anish, Jose, and I are all working on the same repository. And in order to let you do that, Git has the notion of remotes. Undo this change. Um, a remote is basically a copy of the same Git repository that lives somewhere else. It has all the same commit hashes. It has all the same names, potentially. In general, it's just there is, you tell Git there exists a copy of this somewhere else. Um, so for example, if I do git remote v, you'll see that I have a remote called origin. So origin is the default uh, remote name uh, that points to this URL which you'll notice is a GitHub URL, that's because we happen to have a copy of the repository on GitHub. Um, 
And what that means is that I can do, say, branch, that lists all of my branches, but I can also do git branch dash a, which shows me branches that exist elsewhere, basically names that exist elsewhere. So you'll notice that under the remote origin, there is also a name called master. So you'll see that origin head points to origin master, and origin master is a thing that rep parse just shows me which commit something is pointing to. So remotes origin master. So that is pointed to that commit. Similarly, if I look at my master, that is pointed to the same commit. So currently, the, the latest commit on the repository is the same as the latest commit on master in my repository. If, say, Anish made some changes and pushed them to that repository, what a push does, so you may have seen the command git push. What git push does is really this. It's saying push to the um, remote origin and change the name master there to point to whatever the current commit is. So it's basically this. And what this mapping does is it will set remote's origin master to point to head. That's what a push does. So it means that the, it sort of sends all the commit I have locally, sends them to GitHub so they're available for other people to download, um, and then it changes the, the, the name master on GitHub to point to the latest commit that I pushed. And so it's really just another set of names that just happen to live on someone else's computer. Similarly, um, you may have seen git pull. So what git pull does is it first does a git fetch origin. Git fetch is just, Give me the, get me what the latest, um, what all the remote branches at this origin or at this remote, give me what commit they point to. So if I run git fetch origin, notice nothing happens. That's because there are no commits. Uh, there are no changes on origin that I have not seen. If someone were to make a change on origin, so if someone were to push their change to GitHub, fetch would say the remote name master now points to this commit. Right? So if I then did this git rev parse uh, to the master at origin, I would get a different commit hash than the one I have. Specifically, if Anish made some commit on his computer, that would get some name foo, and he would set his master to point to foo, and then he would set the master name on GitHub to point to foo, and when I git fetch origin, it's gonna tell me uh, remote's origin master now points to foo. And then I have to choose how to fold those changes into my master, right? So my master currently points to this commit. Uh, master. Whereas if the master that's on GitHub pointed to a different commit, I have to find a way to reconcile these two. Of course, what I could do is just uh, reset my master to point to whatever this is, right? So I could set my master to just point to whatever commit is on GitHub, if I wanted to. But of course, that means that if I have some commits that I've made locally, then those would just be lost, right? Because they have changed my master to point to something else. So what the, the, you can see a similar example of this is, um, let's say that here I made this repo change. So I make a branch called uh, edit one. And then on, so that points to the current commit. Then I make a commit on master saying fix typo. Then I check out edit one, and I change uh, read by job. Set by that. So now there's one commit on the edit one branch and one commit on master. And they're different, right? The two branches are diverging. And so if I now look at master, I'll see that the latest commit is this one. If I look at edit one, I'll see that the latest commit is this one, and they're different. So the question is, let's say that I now want to bring the changes from edit one into my master. You can think of this as, this is just the same as trying to do a poll, right? There's some name elsewhere that I want to adopt into my current branch. And the way you do that is using the merge tool. So git merge is saying, uh, take all the changes from this other name compared to where they diverged, 
So um, we can look at this like this. So this um, get k is just a handy way to, oh, can I not zoom here? That's fine. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this, but you'll see that here, this point is where master and edit one diverge, as you can see from the graph, right? So this is the shared commit they both branch from. This has one change, and this is another change. What git merge will do, if I'm in master and say git merge edit one, is it will look for the co shared common ancestor, take all the changes from that ancestor to the other branch, and try to apply those to my branch. Or, shown in commands, um, the diff from, this is the shared commit, right? Because I only made one commit on master, to edit one. It will take that difference and apply it to my current branch. And then we'll create a commit on my current branch that includes all those changes. So if I now do git merge, git merge edit one, it creates a new commit for me. The message is merge branch edit one. And you'll see that the merge made that change to readme that I made on edit one. So now if I look at the log, the logs are, I fixed the typo, and then I merged the branch. And notice that the history of edit one has also been merged into my history. But now, this history isn't really linear anymore. It's sort of branching and forking, right? So it splits at some point, and then you merge it back together whenever you create a merge commit. And that merge commit basically says that my previous commit is actually two commits. It is this commit from master and this commit from edit one. And this would be the same if someone made a change on GitHub then I would git fetch origin, and then I would git merge remotes origin master. Here it's telling me already up to date because there are no changes on GitHub that I haven't made locally. That would create a new local commit for me that includes all the changes that have been made. And then if I then do git push, what that would mean is the merge that I made, so all the changes I have plus all the remote changes are gonna be bundled up into one commit and then the remote master, the name on GitHub, will be set to point to that merge commit. So that's then going to include all of the changes that have been made in between. Um, git pull, you may have seen, is really just a shortcut for git fetch origin and git merge master. They're really just doing the same operation. Um, there are other ways to merge changes too, like you can um, pull and then do a rebase. So for example, let's say that uh, Anish made a change to some file. Um, instead of me creating a single commit that has all of his changes and all of mine, I can just sort of undo, rewind all of my changes, apply his changes, and then try to apply my changes on top of that again. It's basically as if all of his commits were like spliced in before mine. So if he adds a line and I add a, uh, add a line, it will be as he added a line first and then I added a line. Sometimes though, imagine that um, we both made changes to the same file. So you have two commits that you're trying to merge, and they both try to change the same thing. Then you end up with what's known as a merge conflict. So a merge conflict basically tells you that Git doesn't know how to reconcile these. Um, if we go back to our edit example, if I make a change to version control where I change uh, try to false, because why not? Um, Um, and on that other thing, I change try to be foo. If I now go back to master and try to merge with edit one, it's telling me that it couldn't merge these changes. Specifically, there's a conflict in version control and automatic merge fail. If I look at this file now, it's gonna give me this kind of information. It's telling me that this line on head, so on my current branch, looks like this, but on the other branch it looks like this, and it doesn't know how to reconcile those changes. It's telling me I have to choose what this segment of my file should look like. And so here, I might say that, oh, I want it to actually say on a repository foo. Once I've made that change, so now there are no other uh, changes in this file, now I can add that file, 
and then say, now commit that result. That's what I want the end result of merging these two to look like. And now if I look at the log, it now has a merge commit that includes the X from the edit one branch and the X that I made on master. So it's now reconciled those changes. When you run into merge conflict, um, sometimes you can just open it with the editor. You can also use git merge tool, which will open sort of a three way view of all the changes and let you like select between them. Um, And not talk about force pushes because we don't have time. Um, okay, so I think that's sort of the overview I wanted to give you. If you you probably get the sense that there's just a lot of stuff going on with Git, um, and this is why people think that it's sort of black magic um, because there are so many commands that do so many weird things, and you end up in weird corner cases where it's telling you that there are merge conflicts and you don't quite know what to do. Um, there are a lot of good tutorials that I've linked through in, in the lecture notes as well that take you through basically interactive tutorials on how would you deal with the situation, what commands would you do, and shows you the commit graph and how different commits are associated with one another. The, the basic thing I hope you take away from this is that Git lets you keep track of changes over time, including from multiple users, recognize whenever changes would conflict and overlap, and lets you resolve those without losing any changes. And it lets you look back at changes you've made in the past and basically keep a record for your own and for other people's sake about what changed and why. Hopefully this notion of sort of names and, and hashes is a good way to think about that because that is the way Git manages things internally. And thinking about names and hashes as completely independent entities in Git is really, really helpful. Um, because if you try to, if, Basically, any other model is going to be wrong, and so you're going to run some command and not understand what it does because you have them mixed up in your head somehow. Um, this is partially because in other version control systems, there's a much closer association between, say, branches and commits. Um, like in Subversion or CDS, which are other somewhat older version control tools, um, the, you basically couldn't play these tricks like rebasing um, because the names and the commits were tied so closely. A lot of content in very little time. Um, I hope some of it was useful. Uh, check out the lecture notes. They have a bunch more details about that we didn't have time to go through uh, about how these commands work. Um, I also recommend you look at the further reading links because they have some of these interactive tutorials. And hopefully some of the exercises should be in a slightly more expanded shape by the time you get to look at them. <sighs> Are there any questions? I know that was a lot of points. No? All right. Well, I guess we'll see you on Thursday.